So what the hell are we doing tonight? I've pitched this show as life wisdom and as career length tweet advice. So let me just jump into it. It's got a slideshow um, that goes with it. And I want to thank Awesome P, who's here in chat, one of our VIPs. He helped build the slideshow. I'm going to show it to you, and we're going to take questions on it. So if you want to hit questions, use our question widget. And at the end of each slide, once we get into the bullets, I'll stop and do questions. And I'm going to finish my last fry. Hmm, that's so good. And then I'm going to finish my drink. So first thing we got to cover, he did a nice interest slide. I am borrowing everything we're going to talk about. And um, it's cut off under me, but... The bottom of this says, hey, this stuff is, uh, I represent me and not Amazon. And you all know that. But I borrowed this. This guy, Kevin Kelly, who uh, wrote a lot for Wired, put out these 68 bits of unsolicited advice on his 68th birthday. And I read them and thought, you know, they're all in random order. And I'd love to use them. Do you get these slides? Maybe. Um, yeah, probably. Hmm. Pentaquant, you can totally critique the slide design. Actually, he wants input on that. Um, so I critiqued it and he changed it. So you're up. You go crazy. Ah, an awesome piece says go crazy. So we wanted to give, and Awesome did a great job of this. By the way, his legal name is Awesome, which is go figure. He's a 20-year-old college graduate. So all of you who are 20 and haven't, graduated college you can't be awesome because he's awesome um <laughs> yeah you can send pentaquat your aerospace one if you haven't i found it a little over the top anyway so kevin kelly is the founding executive editor of wired it's 68th birthday um uh awesome worked with me he divided this into five areas uh we're going to talk about the art of giving and receiving advice for a minute and then we're going to cover the life experiences section tonight. Um, but after that, we're going to roll on. Like, it may take multiple shows to get through all 68. And uh, I, the link is there if you want to go read ahead and cheat. I know some of you won't be able to stand it. But the real point is, I want to comment on what I think of these. So the value you get here, read the list, go crazy. I want to comment on what I think about them. So let's first talk about giving and receiving advice. Um, <clears throat> and uh, Awesome found this in, in Harvard Business Review. So uh, we stole this from, uh, reused it from the Art of Giving and Receiving Advice. The link is there. Uh, you can't click it on the screen. But it's uh, HBR, Harvard Business Review, and this guy, David Garvin. So we've given proper credit. His point really is there's different levels of advice. You have discrete advice, counsel, coaching, and mentoring. And it really comes down to what level. Do you just want um, answers to a specific question? That's advice. Do you want guidance on how to approach something? They call that counsel and so on. So the first thing is when you want to get advice or input, there's this matrix of different levels you can approach things at. Uh, and, uh, <clears throat> yeah, it's, it is pretty impressive, um, to graduate in a couple years. Um, so the main quote from here is seeking and giving advice are central to effective leadership and decision-making yet managers seldom view them as practical skills they can learn and improve. Receiving guidance is often seen as the passive consumption of wisdom, which is actually what you're going to get to do some of tonight. Um, and advising is typically treated as a matter of good judgment. You either have it or you don't, rather than a competency to be mastered. This guy's article, if you go read it, goes on to say these skills on both sides can be practiced. How to get good at taking feedback, which we've talked about on the show before, and how to get good at giving feedback. So why does this matter? Well, this guy, Kevin uh, Kelly, decided to give 68 pieces of advice and so we'll see if we're any good at receiving them. Let's jump in. So life experiences. Um, I love these. These are fun. 
There's five quotes here. I'm just going to take them one at a time. They're in a different order in his list. We grouped them so we could talk about them by topic. The first thing he says is experience is overrated. When hiring, hire for aptitude, train for skills. Most really amazing or great things are done by people doing them for the first time. What do I think of this? Broadly, I agree. I don't completely agree. I have a couple of tweet link things I would say about the value of experience. And if you like memorable quotes, one of them is experience comes from good judgment. No, good judgment comes from experience and experience comes from a lack of good judgment. Similarly, um, experience is what you get when you didn't get what you wanted. Where this is true is people think because you've programmed in Java before or been a contract attorney before is the only in indicator that you could be a good negotiator or, or whatever, be a good programmer. You can learn new skills. It's hard to learn judgment um, and it's hard to train that quickly. However, I absolutely agree. Most really amazing or great things are done by people doing them for the first time. My favorite quick story on this is um, many of you know I built Prime Video. I started the team that, that now runs Amazon Prime Video. And I tell the story, wow, I can't share this exactly on air. Hmm, let me, I can share the story. I just learned how many engineers work on Prime Video. And uh, let's just say that it has four digits. I'll go with that. There's more than a thousand engineers working on it. Um, when I started it, I had a team of six. And when we shipped it, we had a team of nine. And so um, things have grown in the 10 or now 11 years since I was there. But here's the story I tell. Um, the important story is, uh, the important story is my team was composed of four what we call SDE ones, brand new SDEs, um, two of them from college, two of them had one year of experience. I had one guy with like two years of experience and one guy with four years of experience. And we had an intern who'd been an intern for his uh, second, this was his second summer. So the point is the intern actually taught the other new college hires how Amazon systems work because he had used them last summer. And then um, that team, which had a total of seven years of experience in the whole team, six people and an intern, seven years of experience, four of it all in one guy, built the first version of Amazon video. And so uh, what I would say is, uh, and yeah, NBA Hitch, but put them in, man. Put in your follow-up questions in the tool. Um, hit uh, exclamation, park point, bleh, exclamation point questions and put them in and we'll answer them because I wanted to debate these. You can't. Why can't you? I can't. <laughs> All right. Or you can put them in chat and see if somebody else will transport them there. Blaine 86. Good to see you. Okay. So when hiring, hire for aptitude. Look, smart people is great, but I think you need experience. So finishing this story, that team of six people with basically no experience plus me, um, we built the original version of Amazon video and was it oh you're talking about video now yeah i can't talk about it sorry i probably yeah um i was just surprised i mean look it's a big global product now it's used by kajillions more people it's on all sorts of devices there's a lot of reasons but anyway six people build amazon video that's one example um and so uh, there's another example I was reading this morning about some mathematician who just was working on a type of problem called a knot problem, like as in tie your shoelaces type knot. And it's a knot with 11 crossings. And I think it was a woman. And she proved that somehow the knot was not slice. And I had 
I didn't even know what the hell. Like, I'm reading this news article, and I'm like, the knot is not slice. And that doesn't mean can't be sliced. Like, slice is a property of knots in 11-dimensional math space. But anyway, she was a graduate student and solved this problem that's been known for decades. And yes, duplicity, I'm totally with you. I had to read the whole article to even know what the hell it meant. But the point is, is one of those things that's been around for decades, and this grad student solved it. Uh, yeah, perpetual white belt. You may have seen it. It was in the news. Hmm. So bottom line, I agree with half of this and I disagree with half. All right. We'll move on to the next bullet. And I think this is the money bullet for most of you here. Um, uh, the money bullet for a lot of you is if you desperately need a job, you are just another problem for a boss. If you can solve many of the problems the boss has right now, you are hired. To be hired, think like your boss. Um, how do you find out what problems your boss has? Ask. Or ask somebody else. Or learn about the business. But, yeah, ask the boss. Actually, one of the most clever interview questions uh, that some people ask when they interview is, what problems keep you up at night about your business? And then you tell them and they tell you how they can help you with them. That's like a recipe for getting hired. Um, it's not the only one. It's not a guaranteed thing. But uh, yeah, that works a lot. Um, okay, so this one I think is completely dead on. And I've tried to say it on the channel uh, a lot. Um, and uh, I've tried to... Uh, emphasize this, so obviously I agree with it. I'm glad this very smart, wise, older statesman, Mr. Kelly, seems to agree with me. Um, or maybe it's I agree with him. Next point, rule of seven in research. You can't find out anything if you're willing, or you can find out anything if you're willing to go seven levels. If the first source you ask doesn't know, ask them who you should ask next, and so on down the line. If you're willing to go to the seventh source, you almost always get an answer. I don't know for sure, but we have something we use in engineering called the five whys. So like the server went down. Why did the server go down? It was overloaded. Well, why was it overloaded? There was a runaway thread. Well, why was there a runaway thread? You eventually get to the actual root cause of the problem. Um, and you can do this in politics. Um, the Oh, I, I got to be nice. Damn it. Why do I have to be nice? Okay. The politician is dead. Why is the politician dead? Because the politician took an off-label drug. Why did he take an off-label drug? Because the politician listened to a conspiracy theory. Why did the politician do that? You can see where I'm going. It's fake news. So anyway... The point I'm actually getting at while having a little bit of fun. Uh, yeah, I can I can share the slide deck. It's right now. It's just on my my Google Drive, but I can share it out. Um, I'll probably share out the slides in Discord somewhere. Awesome. If you're waiting, if you're I know you're there. How about um, we do this at the end of the show? Cut out just the slides up through life experiences because that's probably all we'll cover tonight but however far down we go through the slides cut them out to that point and post them in the general chat of our discord and that way anybody who wants them uh, can join the discord and get them uh, yeah so the rule of seven is pretty good it fits the five whys. I don't know if it's five or it's seven, how many degrees of Kevin Bacon, but I generally agree with this one. Okay. Um, next up, uh, don't be the best, be the only. Well, this is interesting advice. I happen to agree with it. When, um, when you can, uh, don't only be the best at something, be the only person who can solve a problem, be the only person in a category. Uh, and lots of people say slide deck, um, at least in my world. But um, so trying to be unique, trying to be uh, the person, um, <clears throat> trying to be the person. You want me to open it? Well, oh, whatever. 
uh, trying to be the person who uh, can accomplish a task is great. Trying to be an expert is great. But if you're the only one who can do something, you're invaluable. So for example, when I decided to start this channel, I looked and I saw three things. I saw that Twitch didn't have anybody doing this kind of content, so I could be the only person on Twitch doing career coaching. And I'm a pretty good public speaker and I'm a pretty good career coach and I knew Twitch. And so I realized I could do a credible job and seize the ground of being the only career coach on Twitch. Now, some of you mentioned Dr. K and oh, hey, Furrow Key, thanks for the sub. Uh, appreciate the nine continuous months. Um, uh, Dr. K came on and he does a different type of coaching and there's some other people who share their expertise, but there's really no one doing career development. And so is it a big thing on Twitch? No, but I have faith over time it will grow as Twitch grows and broadens. And even if it doesn't, I got to carve out something new. There are many places to do this. You mentioned Devin. Yeah, Devin does some of it. He comes from a different angle, but you're right. Devin and I are in the same space, which is weird because we're in um, uh, we're in um, the same town, which is just really odd that we've met each other. All right, I'll scroll this up slightly um, so that you get the last uh, part there. Don't be afraid to ask a question that may sound stupid because 99% of the time everyone else is thinking the same question and is too embarrassed to ask it. Um, I think this is very true. Um, and in fact, if you haven't read it, I talk about the book uh, Rejection Proof. Um, what's the worst that happens? Let's say you ask a stupid question and in fact, most people think it's stupid and they weren't embarrassed. It's not that much harm. You'll get an answer, the world will move on. But if you're any good at it, um, the book, Jia Jiang's book, Rejection Proof, is a good way to get good at this and to get over the too embarrassed to ask it. So I'm going to flip over real quick uh, to see if any of you have questions for me. Um, and I'm opening the extension. We'll see if anybody's putting any questions in. We have one. <laughs> How do I mention impact when I'm a new grad with little professional experience? So all the way back at the resume review. Um, so I think we talked about this. I talked about it at that point. You mention impact. Uh, well, if, you, if you're only a student, impact is very hard. But even then, you can talk about how you applied or what you learned that matters in the classes. But if you are a true new grad, I'm not judging you on the impact of your bullets. And your resume is going to be mostly about the classes and the projects. Um, all right. But that's a good question. So I think impact is very hard. If you're a new college grad, it's mostly about your grades, your major, and your projects. But you can have impact on a project. So uh, that's what I would say there. We'll do this other question real quick. Um, doesn't being the only person that can do a role also potentially hurt you into pigeonholing you into not getting advancement because your current spot is so invaluable? Maybe. Um, generally, you'll get advanced to the most valuable thing you can do. And so the key is um, be invaluable or be the only person who can do something better and better. In other words, as a boss, my goal is to promote you or move you up to the most valuable role you can serve and try to find other people to do the less valuable roles. So you might be really good at washing my car with the earlier intern comment, but I can find a lot of people to wash my car and it's not that important to me. I drive an old Jeep, so you know, what the hell, it's supposed to be dirty. I want you in your most valuable role. Basically, you'll never be sad being valuable. Yes, there are bad bosses who will try and hold you back or hold you down. Um, you know, uh, if they think you're really good at something, they won't give you another opportunity. Um, and of course, it's not surprising. Pashi, in his short career, has suffered every possible boss abuse. So if you want to commiserate with someone who's had everything happen, Pashi is a great editor on our YouTube videos and unfortunately just doesn't have luck in career. Um, so uh, let's see, answering this though, I think being the only person who can do something 
Yes. If it's a low value skill you want to get out of, I would flip that around, turn it around and train other people. You want to be the only person who can do something really valuable. The only person who can defeat the six fingered man in sword combat. The only person who can, um, you know, uh, make an accurate three year financial forecast. The only person to beat the S&P 500 in uh, trading average for 17 consecutive years. Like only is very powerful, but not the only person who knows how to run the trash compactor. You definitely want to share that skill, right? You want to get out of that. All right. The next question is not is a nightmare. Uh, let's see. All right. So the next question, nobody's voted on these, by the way. Like there's 100 people here. I'm going to let these sit for a little bit and see if any of them get more than one vote. And I'll do the next page of stuff and come back and answer um, some questions uh, after that. So I'm going to flip back over. Um, we'll go back over here and then I'll go here and we'll scroll down a little bit. So some more life experiences, some more quotes from uh, Mr. Kelly. Um, anything real begins with the fiction of what could be. Imagination is therefore the most potent force in the universe and a skill you can get better at. It's the one skill in life that benefits from ignoring what everyone else knows. So he's got a lot of things packed in this. Um, I generally agree with this. Uh, and T Weirdo, it's exclamation point vote, not vote exclamation point. We added for the moderators an exhortation. <laughs> so I love it. It's this way. There you go. Um, that way they can nag you, which I love. Ah, phooey. It's weird, like, Google decides when to bring up all this page crap and Google Slides and then when to get rid of it because um, it gets in the way. So what do I want to say about this? Uh, I think it's generally true. There's a shorter version I like. And since my promise was tweet length wisdom, let's go for the short version. You can tell me if you like it better. I like chat interaction. The short version is um, reasonable men conform to their environment. Therefore, all progress is due to unreasonable men. Now, that's about conforming rather than imagination. But the unreasonable man is imagining a better way, a different way. And so I do think the ability to see a change is super powerful and the ability to see what can be different and better is powerful and i do agree it can be practiced so i've talked about uh trying to practice the uh making predictions i've talked about trying to practice the idea of um predicting what will happen during the COVID-19 stuff. How will work from home change? How will tele-learning change? How will social distancing stick? When will tourism resume? What will the stock market do? Getting good at seeing the future and understanding trends is one way of practicing imagination. Um, and so I do think, you know, this guy writes for Wired, right? He's a futurist by trade. And so he's saying what he's seen is anything real begins with the fiction of what could be. I think that's right. I just think it can be said more more briefly. Uh, and uh, yeah, <clears throat> I see you all in chat. Uh, okay, I see you all in chat are arguing about uh, the the unreasonable stuff. It's. I've definitely seen it. People who I contend sometimes to just go with the way things are for much too long. And sometimes it's worth fighting what's going on. All right. Uh, following your bliss is a recipe for paralysis if you don't know what you're passionate about. A better motto for most youth is master something, anything. 
Through mastery of one thing, you can drift towards extensions of that mastery that bring you more joy and eventually discover where your bliss is. Um, <clears throat> so I think this is really good. I think uh, follow your bliss or more to the point is lousy advice. Follow your passion is good advice if you know what it is. It is true that you can make a career from almost anything if you have enough energy around it to be the best, seeing the previous quote, to be the only. There are people who have made careers out of the strangest interests if they were fired up enough about them. But for most of you, a lot of you coming out of college or early in your career, simply get really good at something. And then once you get good at that thing, you can move to adjacent skills. So here's some confirmation bias for me, but we'll quickly review my career. I trained as an engineer. I thought I wanted to build robots. I started on a PhD in robotics. I found out that working was more fun because it involved money. So I left my PhD program and went into using the same skills as a developer at a company that paid me money. That was cool, but I discovered even more fun was leading projects being involved in figuring out how to get a project and something done and shipped. And then they let me boss other people around. Oh, I mean manage. They let me manage and lead people. So I moved from programming to leading projects to leading people. Then I moved up through different levels of that, like bigger, bigger, bigger. And finally, I found that I've been leading people and training people and developing people so long, I love to coach. So while I still deliver I still build projects and lead teams as a, as a business, and I run Twitch Prime, which you all know, and some other stuff. Um, I found it was fun to coach and teach, and so that's how I got here. So on a confirmation bias basis, I started out as a programmer, and I ended up as a career coach, and I've gotten happier in every step along the way. But I was a good developer first. So I would generally say, you can go from thing to thing, and but you're always building off your mastery. I got the job as a software engineer. I became a product or a, a program manager of technical projects because I understood the technology. I became a people manager because I could deliver the programs already. And they said, well, let's give him some people and see if he can deliver more. And so on and so on and so on. Um, now, if you know your passion inside out, great. Go crazy. And Gene Tannen, thank you for the Twitch Prime sub. Um, yes, I made that. So here's to you. We're drinking the bocce ball tonight. Mm. Which is OJ vodka and amaretto. Amaretto is a fine liqueur. All right. Um, so I love this quote. I think it's good advice for most people. Get good at something first. Um, all right, lots of people commenting in chat. <laughs> yeah, Twitch Prime, um, you are welcome. We love the fact that we send lots and lots of partners um, uh, monthly checks. It's a big, it was part of how we designed it. We considered it, in fact, our internal language is Twitch Prime is Amazon's love letter to Twitch. That's how we viewed it. So I hope you find it that way. Okay, over the long term, the future is decided by optimists. To be an optimist, you don't have to ignore all the many problems we create. You just have to imagine improving our capacity to solve problems. So this one will get into a lot of semantics. People will argue, uh, is, am I an optimist? Am I a pragmatist? What about being a pessimist? Aren't optimists just foolish dreamers? I think... Over the, I think this quote really um, belongs with the one up top. The Kevin Kelly, who wrote this, clearly believes that imagination and believing in what is possible leads to it getting built. The challenge with true pessimists is they don't believe things can get better. They think the world sucks and is basically going to stay sucky and get worse. And so true pessimists have trouble believing any project is worthwhile or can go anywhere. Um, most startups, and we have Pentaquan here. I'll ask him to weigh in. We also have a couple of startup founders. We have Sean123. I don't know if Hephaestus was here. I haven't been watching closely enough. Maybe some others. Look, um, to found something is a huge act of optimism. 
if you don't believe in it, it's not going anywhere. And so given that your startup is usually going to fail, um, you have to be a huge optimist to even go into it. Uh, yeah, an optimist will found a company. A pessimist will point out how to improve an existing system. Yeah, that's right. And look, as someone who normally worked in improving existing systems, I fall in the middle. I am not a strict optimist. But as my life has gone on, I've tried to become more optimistic. And there's a quote down in this list that will get to that. Um, okay, we're going to use the Google Mice uh, mastery of Twitch chat here. I believe it may have been Churchill, but someone said never waste, um, like never waste a crisis. This is similar. When crisis and disaster strike, don't waste them. No problems, no progress. Um, it is true. And let's look at, uh, this was written during COVID, but let's look at COVID as an example. Your chain, yeah, it was Churchill. Okay. Um, what you do is you look for the hidden opportunity within a crisis or a disaster. Last week, I did a stream on what new businesses need to be founded or expanded or have opportunity because of the COVID-19 problems. And there are so many. For example, I learned there's a problem here in Washington state where people are filing fraudulent unemployment claims with any social security number they can get a hold of and collecting the checks. So a simple thing that needs to be out there is a way to protect your name and social security number from being used for a false unemployment claim. And that matters because one day if you want to go claim unemployment and someone's already been collecting unemployment in your name for six months, that's going to be a problem for you. And there's many, many examples like that. I said, look, there's new distance learning needs. We talked about it for an hour last week. The point is crisis and disaster, they create opportunity. Um, need new vaccines, new mask manufacturer, new ways to make airplanes safe, on and on and on. Similarly, you can use crisis and disaster to build morale on your team and organize them to overcome a problem. How many of you have been part of a team, whether it's school, on a school project, or at work, that pulled together to get something done and you feel bonded to those people as a result and you have fond memories of, yeah, they were kind of assholes, but man, that one time we got all that done and won the prize or shipped the product or came in first or delivered the assignment or won the championship, that's a bonding moment. Uh, and that's a crisis, right? A crisis moment. So yeah, people raising hands, fighting pickles. Here's to you. That has to do with Humans remember key moments of tension. Okay, moving on. There's two more slides here we'll do tonight. And I know you think slides are funny, but that's okay. Um, so I love this one. A vacation and a disaster equals an adventure. So true. And we've talked about this before in another way. If you haven't heard it, um, there's the idea of type one, type two, and type three fun. So type one fun, it's fun while you do it. Go to the pool, go to the bar, go see the museum, uh, you know, whatever. Go see the ancient Roman ruins. Super cool. Type two fun is not fun while you're doing it, but it's fun at the bar later. It might be fun a day later, a week later. It's one of those things that when you're doing it is kind of grueling. This is family camping. Family camping uh, for a lot of families was not that fun. Later, yeah, fond memories. Boy, the best time we ever had was when we all camped together as kids, blah, blah, blah. At the time, it was miserable, wet, and rainy. But you're forging bonds. <laughs> uh, working out, yes. Type 2 fun, working out. Type three fun is type two fun taken to an extreme. So uh, this is like um, military people who've been in the military, like nothing about war was fun. But when they come back, they're a band of brothers. It's the type of stuff that like years later, they're like, oh, those were the best times. You're like, wait, a bunch of people got killed. Yeah, but they were the best times. 
and I'm not in the military, so I can't speak for certain, and I don't demean anybody's tra tragic experience there, but the point is um, you could view, and I think there are a few people who view a war or a military deployment as a vacation plus a disaster, um, and it becomes the memorable moment. And yeah, we have someone here from the Army saying it's that way. So uh, we got a date wrong on vacation and ate two full days worth of food in an hour. <laughs> exactly. So this one I totally subscribe to. Go on vacations, but if they go south, try to roll with them. Um, definitely my wife and I have had some good times when things went poorly. Uh, we've also had good times when they go well, but we've definitely had some things that you just adapt on the fly. Our... There are parts of our honeymoon, which our honeymoon met a typhoon in French Polynesia. We got marooned on an island we weren't even supposed to visit and had to stay the night on an island no one has ever heard of called Huahini. Huahini is home of the bird eating spiders, the ones like with legs the size of, you know, the span of a dinner plate. Let's face it, it wrecked part of our honeymoon, but we will never friggin' forget it. So, and yes, it did rhyme. All right. On vacation, go to the most remote place on your itinerary first, bypassing the cities. You'll maximize the shock of otherness in the remote, and then later you'll become familiar, blah, blah, blah. I think this depends on your comfort level. If you're someone who needs a lot of shock to be stimulated, this is great advice. Um, if you're someone who's a little timid traveling, and I can be, even though I've traveled a lot of places, I'm much more an inch my way into it. This, you know, Kevin must be an extrovert. I'm not necessarily ready to deorbit into the most remote place in a truly foreign country. I like to step into it. But I don't know if this is your vibe, go for it. Um, Next point, the universe is conspiring behind your back to make you a success. This will be much easier to do if you embrace this pro noia. Um, I agree with this. It is philosophical. Um, and the reason French Polynesia is so popular is a dish they have. Now, it's the beautiful islands, but it is a dish they have called um, poisson cru, which basically means bowl of fish it is amazing imagine sushi only way fresher and better um it's my number one favorite thing from tahiti going back to this um i do believe the universe generally gives you a lot of chances and the number one thing that holds us back is our fear which is why i'm always talking about that book rejection proof if you want to say the opposite of this, this guy makes it philosophical. The universe is conspiring behind your back. A different way to say this is we are holding ourselves back from opportunities because of our fears of failure. Most of us feel about feel fearful about taking risks. And so to the point, someone says the universe is indifferent. Maybe. But we make it worse than indifferent by being afraid of what can go wrong more than being optimistic about what can go right. And I've unfortunately lived a lot of my life this way, and I've only gotten better um, at taking risks. And so Aqua Thief says, as Shea LaBeouf once said, just do it. Yeah, great. Go, go, just do it. Um, I think this is right generally. Lean in, try it, take the risk. If you want another book on this, read Tim Ferriss, The 4-Hour Workweek, and the part where he talks about risk is only risk until you try it. Most risks work out. Uh, so, all right, we'll do these next two, then I'll take questions. So if you want to vote on questions or put questions in, we will do questions, then one more page, then more questions, then we're out, because I'll be out of drink. Be prepared. When you are 90% done, uh, so I think a word got left out here. When you are 90% done with any large project, a house, a film, an event, an app, the rest of the myriad details will take a second 90% to complete. 
that is completely true in my experience. Uh, here's an example. Um, this sheet, it's got all of my to-dos from the last weekend on it. It's like 50 lines of stuff. I never get them all done because you keep adding to it. I keep adding to it as I go. Um, houses, we're still working on the house, events, your wedding, anything you plan. And so be aware what isn't covered here, and I'm going to do in a second show, a, a show another time, is how to know when to quit on the second 90%. A big question I have in my notes for a show to do in the future, and I actually ask um, Awesome. He's got a lot of things he's working on, but I told him this would be a good show for his own self-development, is how to know when is good, good enough. Um, and NBA Hitch likes it. How do you know when to stop? When are you over-investing? And it's super hard to know well when to call it good enough. And awesome, if you don't mind me sharing and you don't get a chance to say, he built a slide deck based on my initial request and he busted his ass um, to put 10 of these sayings into slides with supplemental research. And basically he got stuck because he kept trying to make just 10 of the 68 things more and more thorough and complex and ready to go and add value to them. And he had trouble just saying, you know, uh, when to cut it off. And if Awesome wants to start his own stream, he's certainly welcome to. Uh, he seems to uh, enjoy being the man behind the scenes, doing the analyst work, the research work, and I appreciate it. Different things for different people. But if he ever wants to come on stream, we can totally do that. Or start his own. I'd be happy to raid over to it someday. Um, <clears throat> all right. So Pentaquant saw his other deck that's being referenced here. And yeah, it it readability matters. Like simplicity is an art form of its own. All right. Um, finally, extraordinary claims should require extraordinary evidence to be believed. I think what this last part says is don't believe conspiracy theories. Like there are a surprising number of people who believe that Bill Gates is trying to help make vaccines so he can inject microchips into people. First, those are going to be some impressive microchips that are going to survive in the body and maintain viability and usefulness while being injected through a low gauge needle into billions of people. But second, a claim like that should require a lot of evidence. Meanwhile, there's people who just want to believe that like Gates is trying, well, whatever. I can't even articulate what they want to believe. So I'm going to go to questions. The point is, the more unusual the claim, the more data you should need to back it up. Uh, let's roll over. We'll go back to camera view and we'll see if anybody had, oh, there's a lot of questions. You voted. Thank God. Oh, this is great. Mods, pop up the first question. The first question is, what do you wish new grads did more of early in their career? Deliver results, build something, ship something, write something, draw something, produce an artifact, have an impact. Don't tell me what you thought, researched, aided with, collaborated, what did you do make something make something it's rant time we don't do the rant as much anymore because i'm i'm anyway i'm ranting on this make something make an impact have a result um so i wish new grads did that and then i wish they followed the magic loop which we talk about all the time the idea of do your job well then either figure out on your own or go ask your boss, what could I do to help? And it's not because I'm a boss. It's because that's how you grow. So I do wish new grads also had a plan to develop in some way or were just eager to ask questions and try to find ways to grow. Let's take an example. Oh, oh boy. <laughs> uh the auto mod has caught an interesting comment we're going to let through. I produced a child. 
Good for you, I hope. That isn't what I necessarily wish more new grads did early in their careers, but if it's working out for you and your partner, here's to you. Please take care of that child, please. Be a good parent. You are one now. <laughs> I produced misery. <laughs> you guys are so jaded. You're terrible. All right. What else do I wish new grads did? Yeah, get something done. The other thing, I guess, is be curious, be helpful. So, for example, uh, I talked earlier about how awesome uh, who made these slides. He's 20. He graduated college early. He reached out to me and said, hey, how can I help you make shows? I didn't know him. But now I counsel him. I try and help him grow. He gets feedback on his slides here from people like Pentaquant. He gets named. I've helped him try and find some other career opportunities. Why? He reached out and volunteered to do something. Read Rejection Proof and get good at asking. Get good at taking risks. Um, haven't haven't uh, graduated yet. Feels bad. Um, lots of people have failed. Failed is okay. Um, failure, you know, interesting quote I saw. It's not in this list, I don't think. But what if we saw failure as just learning? Um, in other words, every time you fail, you're just learning how to do it better or learning what works for you. Go get better at it. it sounds like dating for men. Uh, <laughs> rejection proof is dating for men. Um, it's also just dating success. All right. I love this question. Bottom line, short answer, go do something. Next question. Um, in interviewing someone, has there ever been a holy shit, we need to hire this person right now moment? What prompted this? I have that moment sometimes. I'm wise enough to know that sometimes I need to wait um, and get other people's opinion because usually everyone has weaknesses. And so, uh, but the question is, what's prompted this? It's usually when they have an insight or they offer something that I'm like, oh, my God, I would have never thought of that. That's really smart. Um, in other words, when they manage to teach me something in the interview, I don't do this right now, but it used to be in one on ones when I was developing my team. I would actually say, look, um, every time you come to a one on one, I want you to teach me something. In other words, I want you to think enough about this one-on-one -on -one and what you should be sharing that you teach me something new. So I think um, that kind of when an interviewer can actually change my thinking in 30 minutes, that can lead to that holy shit moment. I kind of had a holy shit moment today. I interviewed someone earlier today who's done exactly what we need done. Um, and so, and when I say exactly, I mean very exactly. And so even though it goes contrary to the earlier experience, it's a chance or the earlier quotes, it's a chance to hire perfect experience. He was also smart and seemed to have ability, but I think about that. Like, would I hire perfect experience? So holy shit is usually the person wows me with their insights. They're able to say something I just haven't thought of or advance the thought of my thinking. Um, huh. That happened to me. It was because I was a warm body. All right. Um, next question. With COVID-19, I'm being onboarded for a new job virtually. How can I make a good first impression? Same answer as what should new grads do? Find a way to contribute and help quickly. Even if that help is not the most effective, try to find a way to not be a burden, not a full-time burden. Try to be self-starting and self-learning as much as you can. Rather than say, can you teach me blah, blah, blah. Say, can you tell me how I can go learn blah, blah, blah quickly. I'll try it. And if I have any questions, can I follow up with you? Like, don't don't be don't be a burden. Be a contributor, uh, and that's how you make a good first impression. Uh, the second piece, I guess, is don't do anything dumb. By which I mean, don't show up late. Don't f off. Don't come on camera in your pajamas. You know, show a little bit of professionality. Uh, be be engaged. 
But the key really is come up to speed and start contributing. I share this all the time, but we learned at Amazon that one of the first signals of whether or not a person, an intern, is going to succeed is do they ship, um, do they contribute code in the first week? I'm talking about software engineers versus those that don't. So <laughs> ask well thought out questions. Yeah, Pentaquan. Don't be lazy, right? Don't just look for other people to make your life better. You're there to make their life better, not the other way around. Um, it's servant participation. You're there to serve. If you take a posture of I'm there to serve others and help them, that's going to take you a huge long way. All right, next question. These are great questions, by the way. Thank you all for voting. You're awesome people. And I hope the answers are getting you some stuff out of it. Uh, ha. Kristen's also got a good one. Like she's on the social, the friendly side of things. How are you? Um, what's one way you've distinguished yourself as the only one to do a job that has helped you in your path where you are now? I would say the biggest way I've distinguished myself is taking risks well thought out risks hopefully but standing up for a risk i want to take pushing for it and then owning the result good or bad it turns out if you have a reasonable plan and you push to do it and it fails and you clean up the mess you'll get let off the hook and if it succeeds people will be like holy shit so in my case, I've told this story before, but early when I was came to Amazon, um, I uh, pushed to put our Amazon video service, as it was at the time, what became Prime Video, onto TiVo. And there was opposition to doing it. And I pushed, um, I said, uh, in the meeting, I said, well, to do this TiVo project is only going to take 7% of my team's resources for the year, and that's a reasonable risk, so I'm doing it. And the people around me had been he hemming and hawing, but they decided, ah, eh, let this relatively then young new manager, let him do it, you know, whatever. As he says, it's only 7% of his resources. Well, then it worked, and everybody was super thrilled, and I later saw my document that was written up to promote me to director, in Amazon, uh, and that document said, well, you know, without Ethan, we wouldn't have had TiVo. And so taking a risk and succeeding, good, but even taking a risk and failing is better than living an undistinguished, pablum-like life. And so the way I've distinguished myself is by taking calculated risks. And am I the only one who can do that? No, but most people are too afraid. Most people are too worried about what can go wrong. And yes, Duke of Thought, TiVo came and went before you were born. I know that. But it still helped my career, and you still know what it is. So it's not completely gone. All you youngins, get out of my chat. Um, all right. This is great. We're rolling good questions. Let's do another one. Uh, what do I do when my product manager isn't doing their job? They're asking for deliverables before creating requirements. I'm a product designer, and it's nearly impossible to do my job this way. <laughs> so let me generalize this question. What do I do when somebody I need something from is not doing their job well? I'm a whatever, and I need something from the other whatever. Okay. This is tough. You have to lead them through doing their job while making it also, without throwing them under the bus, visible to their boss that they're not doing their job. So you want to do a little of each. You want to make clear to your management that you don't have what you need and it's hurting your productivity. And you want to make clear to this person, I need this thing. Here's why I need it. How can I help you create it? Um, I can't do what I'm doing without it. And you just have to, you have to lead them through that need and you have to insist on it. Um, you may need to be firm here and say, look, I can't design a product that doesn't have requirements. However, I'm willing to work with simple requirements and I'm willing to iterate with you. 
can you spend 10 minutes and rattle off the key requirements and I'll write them down and email them back to you. Basically, uh, look, all through your life, you'll end up being surrounded by un incompetent, uninterested, disengaged, or semi-competent peers. Hopefully not very often. If that's common for you where you work, you work at a bad place, try to go somewhere else. We're gonna do a show in the next few weeks, next month on career switching. Not job switching, actually changing your career, which is only somewhat related to this. But the point is, if you're in a crappy place, try and go somewhere better. If not though, try and lead this person through it. And I think Kristen said something about working with a manager to get the expectations set. Yeah, get your manager's help to start a conversation on expectations. Um, here is a gap we have, how can we improve incrementally? Is it, yeah. And how can I help? How can I contribute? So she's right about this. Uh, oh, and try to be aware when you're one of the people too. Yeah, well, we actually, to be fair, all of us are this person some of the time where we want to look, what's easier? I go to you and I say, person, Samantha. Hey, Samantha, I need a business plan for Project Foo. Thanks. That's great. I got to say what I need. I had to do no work. And hopefully later you come back to me with lots of results. That's best for me. You magically figure out what I need and you produce it. So all of us in a hurry and a rush, we hope that it's as obvious to the other person what we need as we want ourselves. But often it's not. And so... Um, Point is, I guess, uh, everyone is this person some of the time. Try to be aware when you need to give more context, when you need to do more to enable your peer to help you. Um, and you can win a lot of their effort. And the greatest question in the world is, I've asked you to do this thing. Do you understand? Do you have everything you need? Ask questions. I suck at this, but the more questions you ask, the better. And my mods have helpfully pointed out that if you would like career coaching for me one-on-one, -on -one, I do it as a way of raising money for my favorite charities. Hmm. All right. One more question. Uh, then we'll go back, finish the last of the slides and hit up the, rest, the last slide and hit up the rest of the questions. So this is the last question we'll do right now. Is it wise to be wary of human resources? I.e., is it wise to avoid sharing concerns about your motivation in your current role? Hell yes. HR, hey, awesome Dave, good to see you here. Hell yes, HR works for the company. Sometimes HR has some morals and also wants to help you, but any company big enough to have HR is unfortunately big enough to be a bureaucracy. And I hate to say it, but HR, their first job, and this sucks, but it's their job, is to protect the company from lawsuits, and their second job is to protect the company from abusive employees. It should be that HR is actually there to make the group more productive and to help the humans get work done. But remember, this is a double-edged sword. This is just like asking, let me rephrase this. Is it wise to be wary of cops? i.e. is it wise to avoid sharing your brother-in-law's shady dealings with a police officer yes cops and hr get the way they are because people are always trying to abuse them um hr has heard so many lies and they have seen so much screwed up stuff oh my god i will tell you this story um no kidding. I'm going to give you the really short version. We had some dude in our office who was trying to show he was into this woman. And the way he did it was take a dump under her desk. That was his idea of showing how into her he was. So when I say HR, human resources. When I say HR, people have done every crazy thing and they've seen it all. And yes, that, and no, it didn't work. Uh, but I kid you not, 
Oh, and then when we figured out who it might be and confronted him, he admitted it. Yes, I took that poop. It's only because I care. This is, you cannot make this shit up. And Human Resources deals with this all the time. Uh, <laughs> your chat comments are definitely funny. Um, it's, yeah, you cannot make this shit up. That is so true. You cannot. And you have to clean it up off the floor. It is. So when you wonder why HR is sometimes jaded, they have seen everything. Um, I had two people on my team years ago. Suddenly they both wanted leaves of absence the same day. Like they're both, we need vacation. It has to be immediate. Turns out, and they're like, why, why? And I'm like, oh, I just really feel a need for a break. No, it turns out you talked to both of them. They'd had a little dating relationship on the sly because one of them was married and it had gone south and now they didn't want to be around each other. So the point is people are totally willing to lie to HR. So it's no wonder HR is worried. Uh, yeah. So HR, I'm not saying they're great, but remember, just like cops, let's face it. How many people are truthful with cops? Do you know how fast you were going? Yeah, 103. No, nobody says that. They say, what seems to be the problem, officer? Um, you know, uh, everybody has a story. And so, uh, and it is true, the cop, they are the cops of the business world. They're in that role. It's a tough role because everyone is always trying to flim flam them in some way. Uh, to pull one over on them. So we're going to move on, but I would, I would be, you unfortunately need to be wary of HR. It's just like police. Like if, if your spouse turns up dead, the police are not your friend. You may think like, no, 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 there's film of me sitting calmly at my desk here on stream with a hundred of you. They still, they're like, the husband did it. it that's the way it is. All right. We're going to go back, finish those other, um, page of things real quick because I promise to get through life experiences then we'll take a couple more questions and we'll call it a night so flipping over here um, we got one more page to roll acquiring things will rarely bring you deep satisfaction true there's also research that shows this but acquiring experiences will here's Anya this is why we have, and it's almost gone. This is the last of the drink, but that's okay. I'm slurring, so it must be good. Look, experiences are golden. There's research that shows this. The joy of buying things won't last. The joy of doing things will. Since this is backed up by research, and I agree strongly, I'm just going to leave it at that. It's why we have a travel channel, a travel pictures thing in our Discord. Feel free I've learned a ton of stuff, by the way. I've made friends all over the world in this channel. It's awesome. And one of the guys um, who's in our Discord a lot, uh, he taught me about this thing called bog walking. And it's basically you use snowshoes to stay on top of the squishy stuff in bogs. So cool. And uh, I'm going to go hopefully do that sometime. There's people all over the world. We have Liger here. Um, Liger's invited me to Singapore. Experiences are worth way more than uh, what you're going to do, what you're going to buy, my opinion. So the only place I buy stuff is gear that helps me do stuff. All right. Um, next thing. Gratitude will unlock all other virtues and is something you can get better at. I agree. Be appreciative. It's cheap. It's free. It's so easy to say thank you. Very early in my college career, I needed something really dumb. I honestly think I needed a nail. I moved into my first college dorm and I needed a nail to hang a picture. But of course, I didn't pack nails in my crap for my dorm. So I went down to the basement and found like the maintenance guy. And I asked him if I could get a nail or maybe something else. And at the end of it, I just said, oh, thank you, sir. And nobody called him sir. They all treated him like shit. And he was over the moon because I said sir. When I said, thank you, sir, he was like, wow, you're going to go far, young man. It was, it was one three-letter word. Showed some gratitude. It's cheap. It's free. Kristen will tell you all about this because she's much better socially than I am. All right. Um, 
Perhaps the most counterintuitive truth of the universe is that the more you give to others, the more you'll get. Understanding this is the beginning of wisdom. Star Trek quote, for those of you who don't know, early Star Trek movies. Um, I It is very hard to give things away. I give bottles of wine to my friends. They give me bottles of wine when they visit me. So I end up with the same amount of wine, only everybody feels better. Um, you know, uh, I give to you here on this channel. I give of myself and share what I know. I get invited all over the world to visit cabins in Norway and have chocolate dragons in Amsterdam and experiences I could never get without the help of locals. We have Tommaso in Portugal who uh, is teaching me about Portugal and about his hometown of Rome. And we have all these wonderful people I get from you by giving. So generally, you may not get it back in money, okay? There is some of those. Some of you will interpret this as, if I give away money, I should get back more money. That doesn't work. But it is true, the more you give to others, the more you'll get. And so I would encourage you, find something you're good at and give. Example, again, Awesome has time and he gives of that time to produce things like these slides, and I give him feedback and growth that he values. His ability to produce slides is relatively cheap for him. My ability to give him advice and help is relatively cheap for me. This is how it works. We're both giving things that are cheaper to us than they are to the other person. He has no access to the council, and so he values it very highly. I have limited time, so I value the help very highly. That's how this barter system works. Waco is popular. If you ever come to Waco, Texas, I'll give you the grand tour. Ha! <laughs> There's only one place I want to go in Waco, and you know where it is, Ojo. Uh, there's, there's a famous site somewhere outside of Waco, and I'm old enough to remember. Um, all right, perhaps, yeah, <laughs> that's right. Branch Davidians represent, um, perhaps the most counterintuitive. Okay. We did that one. This is true. It's hard to cheat an honest man. So I really wanted, yeah, I bet it's just an ancient pit in the ground. I really want to talk about this. Why is this true chat? Do you think this is true? Is it hard to cheat an honest man or is it really easy because an honest man is gullible? True or false, this comment. Sound off in chat. No, it's not true. <sighs> not if you were a good cheat. False, false. You really think it's false? Asking a used car salesman. So, you know, marketers, honest is not the same as gullible, right? Depends on being what an honest man is. Uh, ask me again in a year. So where this is true is honest men won't get into exposed positions that make them easy to exploit. In other words, a lot of cheats or cons require someone who's trying to work an underhanded deal to begin with. So the way you sucker people by telling them you have cheap real estate in the Everglades in Florida or you have a bridge, a bridge to sell them in Brooklyn, they've got to be trying to scam on their own. And so I think what this is saying is it's easiest to scam a scammer. Honest people will smell a con. This is what NBA Hitch is saying. The Nigerian Prince thing. They'll smell something and they're not trying to make out on free money from Nigeria. And so they don't get suckered in. The Nigerian Prince scam is aimed at a person who's not completely honest. So, yes, this is open to interpretation, but I think it's true. Art is in what you leave out. Totally, right? Michelangelo supposedly said when he was carving the, da uh, the David which is a fantastic piece. But when he was carving marble, he said, I see the figure inside the statue and all I have to do is remove what doesn't belong. Um, I'm not an artist, so I can't com comment on this deeply, but I do think so much of art 
is from creative omission, not by specifying every detail. Uh, footnote, some people say that's also super important in seduction or romance. It's not about everything. It's about the right amount. Okay, um, learn how to take a 20-minute power nap without embarrassment. Excellent advice. Fantastic advice. <laughs> totally, uh, and yeah, <laughs> it's also true. Um, honest men are hard to cheat twice, for sure. <laughs> uh, power naps are super, super powerful. Duh. I do it. I've, got a, I've even taken naps on the job at work when I'm too tired to think or work. Um, I have laid down in my office on the floor if necessary. When you're just worn out, you're worn out. And um, we used to have a saying in college, which was great when I was like 20, which was um, sleep is the last refuge of the, of the weak and insecure. Uh, credit to Barry Brummett, a classmate of mine who came up with it. Sleep is the last refuge of the weak and insecure. It works great when you're 20. You can get away with that. As you get older, take the power nap. Finally, before we go back to questions, so this is your last chance to go vote, to go ask me things about any of these quotes. Eliminating clutter makes a room for your makes room for your true treasures. Oh, so true. I've written a bunch of stuff I shared with Liger about how to avoid. Um, I've written uh, about how to avoid, how to focus on doing what's most important and how to get rid of all the other stuff. I talk about the book, Eat That Frog. Someday I'll go through what I've written on channel. It's going to form the first chapter of the book I'm going to write. So we'll do it sometime when we're talking about the book I will eventually write. But eliminating clutter makes room for your true treasures. Yes. I think this is more a statement about how you use your time than the crap filling up your house. So, uh, yes, and eat that Pepe the Frog. Go right ahead. All right. So that's everything. I do think, look, clearing crap out of your life is super valuable. Clearing crap out of your work schedule, distractions, is also super valuable. You will not produce results. All this stuff about producing results, having impact, all the stuff we talk about in a resume, if you get bogged down in doing someone else's administriv uh, administrivia, being the software developer who fixes the bugs, being the editor who does all the last edits looking for where the commas go, you'll never have an impact. You've got to get rid of the clutter and focus on your best skill and figure out how to get paid for your best skill. All right, so with that, we've covered enough. Little teaser here. Next time we'll do personal development. So there's a bunch more of these quotes. We'll talk about the personal development ones next, but not tonight. We're going to go back, do any more questions we have, and call it a night. Call it a wrap. We have no question with more than three votes. I'll give 60 seconds and see if that improves. Then I'll answer one and two and one or two and call it good. Vote, vote, vote. What do you most want to know from me about anything we've talked about? This is your chance. <laughs> Duplicities is trying really hard. There we go. Oh. T Weirdo beat him to it, can spell the word vote. <laughs> and that's how to ask questions. All right, let's see what we got here. I love it when you all have asked good questions. What's Jeff's true smell? Oh, all right, we got one with a ton of votes now. Let's do that one. Vision slash imagination is a pro and is recognized, but often in hindsight. Going forward, there is much inertia. Any thought on how to overcome this inertia? Any advice on delivery of an idea and having people support you to gain momentum? This is a very multi-part question. Let me think about it. Okay. My shortest piece of tweet length wisdom I give people at Amazon is results are the currency of credibility. So this is going to play right into the magic loop. You can throw the hat icon into chat if you want the magic loop. 
Um, in the magic loop, I say, do your job well. Then step two, go ask your boss or your manager what else you can do to add. And thank you, chat supporters. You're wonderful. We built all these great emotes. All of you paid your five bucks or more in the case of Plus David and some others to be subs. Might as well use your emotes. In the magic loop, though, step one is do your job well. To get the credibility to be able to take risks, you need to first deliver. So I told the TiVo story earlier, and it drew out Duke of Thought commenting on ancient technology, not terribly different than pounding rocks together to make fire. But the only reason I was able to get my leaders to go along with my desire to build the TiVo project is I had already shipped Amazon video. So I had already built something that was up and working and shown I could deliver. Basically, you're gonna, um, if you, the question here, I think what the asker wants to know is what clever things can I say to overcome inertia and get support? I can talk about some of the clever things you can say, but what you can really do is do your core job really well first and earn some credibility by having delivered value on what you're asked to do before you go asking others to come with you. Now, you can also do that earlier in your career. So if you do that at a different job, your resume may bring some of that respect. If you have a PhD, your PhD may bring some of that respect. Your education, basically, credibility is what brings you this type of support. Now, what else can you say? Well, you can invite them along. You can ask them what it would take for them to be supportive. What uh, could they gamble with you? Bezos has a thing where he asks, would you take this risk with me? Would you be willing to disagree if you don't think my idea is good and still commit to it? Would you be willing to take a big risk? Um, I think you can ask those questions. Uh, and so any advice on delivery of an idea and having people support you to gain momentum, yeah, you ask them and you offer to support them along the same lines. You say, look, I want your help with this. What can I help you with? Can you support me in this? People like to be invited. They don't like to be told. So trying to browbeat people and tell them, well, you need to do this. Anybody like... um. Quote right now, right? How much trouble is Biden in for many reasons? U.S. presidential candidate Joe Biden, he said uh, now infamously, if you don't support me, you ain't black. Um, talking about black voters and if they don't support him. Well, people do not like to be told what's true. They, not, they don't like to be told what's true, but they don't like to be told what they have to do. Nobody likes feeling forced. It's about invitations. How do you get better at being inviting? Poor wording, mindful. Uh, but uh, you ask questions. We all like to talk. We don't like to ask really sincere questions. We like to ask leading questions or controlling questions. Read the book, Humble Inquiry. Um, I think it's Edgar Schein is the author. Read the book Humble Inquiry. Or as Awesome says, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Okay, what do we got left for questions? We have a couple with three votes. We're going to drop into speed run. Every question in 30 seconds or less, maybe a minute. Some of them take 30 seconds to read. We don't count that time against me. So next question is, I wanted to start a website and get into affiliate marketing, but I saw the Amazon slash your commission rates, considering blah, blah, blah. Is it a bad idea to start a website? Also, why did Amazon do that? So I don't talk about Amazon stuff here. I don't talk about Amazon policy ever, so I'm not going to answer any of that. Um, we did a show last week, Go Watch the VOD, about starting businesses during a pandemic or a disaster. They usually do very well if you have a good idea. So, yes, start your business. Amazon questions out of bounds. Moving on. What's the hardest lesson for you to learn during your career? 
holy crap, that depends on who you are. My hardest was probably to learn to shut my mouth and be less abrasive, um, to be less about the results and more about people because I used to think only the results mattered. And if I had to bulldoze over stupid, stupid people, I would. Um, unfortunately, stupid people got mad when I did that and they probably weren't always that stupid. So I had to learn to value other people. That said, so if I wanted to generalize that for all of you, I'd say social skills, improving your EQ, your ability to relate to others will be very valuable compared, uh, not only your, ugh, wow, too much to drink and hurrying too much, um, compared to only hard skills, having soft skills will really help you in your career. Okay, next question. Is wearing a mask to an in-person interview professional? Sure, absolutely. If you have to do an in-person interview in this time, I think wearing a mask is fine. And anyone who would have real issues with that, you may not want to work for. So it's a little bit strange, but uh, I would say totally. Uh, yeah, emotional quotient. All right. Um. Art is what, next question, art is in what you've, oh, they switched orders. We'll see which one gets popped up. Waiting, waiting. We'll get to the art question. What would you want to say to someone who wants to start building relationships in the professional world? Being consistent and staying in touch are always said, but there are things outside of that that one should consider. Yeah, be authentic. Um, don't network with people like, I occasionally get people who say, hey, I want to add you to my network. Oh, I feel valued. I feel used. Reach out to people about some shared interest. It can be, I see you have a cat and I like cats. It can be whatever. I see you're a skier. I see you went to the University of FUBAR. Um, but reach out about something and be sincere in your questions. Is uh, that's what I would I would say to someone who wants to start building relationships. Ask about something honest and discuss it. You build a relationship by relating to the person and talking about something they want to talk about, not talking about what you want. So be focused on what they want and ask them about something they'd like to talk about. Uh, all right. Um, next question. How do you decide whether to do a task for someone off the record or without making too much noise. Uh, I, I guess I would decide how illicit it is. So if it's really bad, I wouldn't do it. If someone just needs a little help with something, uh, sure. And if it's not unethical, I would do something that they just want to get done and may not be the top priority. Like I help people all the time with things that are kind of side priorities or side projects. I never am gonna help someone with something unethical. So you gotta decide where to draw that line. Um, if it's easy for you and will really help them and it's ethical, I would do it. Do, it's totally fine to do people a favor. Uh, if it's unethical or it's a total pain in your butt, just say, oh, I'm sorry, I can't get to that. Um, all right, I hate my job, but it's pretty comfy. How do I get motivated to switch? Maybe you don't. It depends on what you want in life. Uh, in other words, if you really want your career to grow, then, um, or if the hate is too painful, like you kind of have a contradiction here. You say it, you hate it, but it's pretty comfy. When I had a job like that, I got bored and eventually I felt useless and bad about myself. Um, I would say you need to figure out how you really feel and what's important to you. Um, if being comfy and being able to sit around for a while, even though you don't like it, is um, okay with you if that's what you want. I would say, though, try and imagine your future. Um, if you do that for a long time, it will hold you back. Do you still want to be in a low-level, I presume, comfy job you hate in 10 years? Uh, you know, I would, I would want to, and by the way, what says you can't find a job that you love that's also pretty comfy? In other words, part of my job is sending games to gamers, hiring people, talking to people, coaching here. Um, I love my job. I get paid well for it. You can find a comfy job uh, that you don't hate. So it takes work and it may take multiple switches, but you can 
uh, change what you're doing. All right, last question. This is it. And then we're done. Art is in what's left out. Uh, do you see this as applicable to a software engineer? I'm assuming that's what SWE means. Could mean like single white Egyptian or single white Eskimo. Um, and in that case, I don't know. I would say leave the final block out of the igloo or you can't get in. But art is in what's left out. Do you see? Yes, completely. Simpler software is more elegant. Um, totally true that software with too many features and too many menu options is just confusing and nobody can use it. Uh, you just think about the usability difference between Macs and PCs as an example. Um, yeah, chat, have fun. What are all the possible connotations of SWE? I've assumed software engineering, but boy, I'm sure there's a lot of things you can make out of SWE. We'll end on that note. Studs with empathy. I like that. That's going to be very popular. If you can actually pull streaming with Ethan. Oh, mindful. That might be a winner. There you go. Um, art is in what's left out. Do you see this as applicable to streaming with Ethan? Completely. Savage white evangelic. Hmm. Yeah. Society of women engineers. So art is in what's left out. Yeah, totally. Software that's simpler, that's elegant, that accomplishes one thing well is better than, uh, yeah, silly wood effigy. Not too sure about that. Uh, sad worm empathizer. Okay. <laughs> These are pretty good. All right, folks. So look, I'm going to come back in a week. I have a lot of shows lined up now. They aren't all scheduled. They aren't all on our schedule, but I have a lot of good shows coming up. We're going to talk about some very interesting topics. I want to thank Kristen. She was here earlier. I don't know if she's still on. She sent me this book that she likes nine lies about work. So I thought maybe I'll do a series of shows where from time to time I'll take each lie and I'll do a show discussing one or two of the lies and whether or not they're true or if they're lies. I could do the same thing um, with the five dysfunctions of a team. Uh, we could discuss the lists. I'm going to finish this list. I've got some other shows I want to do. Got a lot of good stuff to go pull off. So with that said, um, hey... I hope you've had a good time tonight. I hope you've learned a lot. Uh, it's been great having all of you here. Chat has been more active than usual. There's a lot of you lurking because there's a lot of viewers here I haven't seen in chat. So please follow if you haven't. Join our Discord. Feel free to sub. And if you ever need um, private coaching, I do that to raise money for charity. Feel free to reach out to me in Discord or elsewhere. Um, the great thing about it being a charity project, you don't give the money to me. You give it straight to a charity. I give you my best efforts and insights. Uh, and so everybody wins. And with that, it's been really nice having you all here. It's been nice seeing Hephaestus here. I'm not sure when he got here, but we were talking about startup founders earlier, and I was thinking of you if you missed that. So Royal Gaming 2020, I love you. As well, Devin and I, uh, Devin just went offline, so he was streaming earlier. I'm glad some of you came over from there. I will be back at 6 p.m. next weekend. I don't think I up uh, remembered to uh, update the topic. So when it says I'm going offline, I'm going to talk about uh, short wisdom quotes. Good news is it's at the same time next week. Um, Khalees, wow, I enjoyed my stay. I'm glad you did. Matchstick man, it's good to see you here. All right, everybody, as I say, cheers in chat. So uh, we made a special sign off. If you're a sub, um, you can roll them out. So cheers, everybody. Have a good night. <laughs>